Uh, so I would like to call the six-year-old by case A and uh, we'll call the 12-year-old by case B. So uh, patient A was admitted to a pediatric hospital for uh, management of the high-grade fever. And uh, patient B uh, had a history of high-grade fever, which was followed by the restriction of the shoulder motion. On clinical examination, uh, the, uh, for, the pa uh, for patient A had his hip in flexion, abduction, and external rotation position. Uh, there was pseudo paralysis of the joint and severe pain was present on log rolling. So as we can see in the image, the right thigh is nearly twice the size of the left. So Gaurav, usually we see an uh, septic hip <clears throat> or an osteomyelitis. Do you see this much of swelling of the extremity? No, sir. Yeah, so uh, that is where that was very striking that they have kind of a compartment kind of uh, uh, swelling. And whenever you see the swelling of the extremity uh, more than proportionately more than what it should be with an isolated infection, it should be alarming uh, about this MRSA infection because the meat would tell you subsequently that these patients have venous thrombosis and this venous thrombosis leads to uh, uh, swelling. And other way, other thing is this, the toxins which they liberate, they can penetrate the soft tissue. And so they have a lot of edema uh, in the surrounding. So whenever you see swelling out of proportion to the underlying infection, always think of MRSA. That's the first lesson we learned. Yeah, meet, move, move ahead. So uh, this was the presentation of uh, patient A. Patient B had a global tenderness around the left shoulder and his active abduction was limited to 20 degrees. So for the first, for, for patient A, we uh, performed an MRI of the right uh, femur with, along with the pelvis with both hips and suspecting uh, sept uh, septic hip. And uh, it confirmed that the acute there was acute right femoral osteomyelitis along with septic hip. And uh, he, he also had an ecogenic thrombus in the right common femoral vein and the superficial femoral vein. So like usually when, uh, what is the indication of getting an MRI? Sarovar is with us in a suspected case of septic arthritis of hip. Sarovar. Do you get MRI in all the cases or it's just a clinical diagnosis? No, no, no not always, not always. In, in cases uh, such uh, such a case, when uh, I don't have any clear indication that what, what has happened when or if the hip is involved probably, in those cases we go for MRI. That's right. Gaurav, I mean, your... Uh, joint is involved in fact, nearby joint. That, that, that's right. So Gaurav, your uh, take on it? When would you advise an MRI in a case of suspected septic hip? Sir, in uh, in young kids, I try to get an ultrasound. In infants, I try to get an ultrasound. And if it gives me sufficient information like effusion, then I uh, proceed with the uh, arthrotomy. But in, in, in younger mm. kids, I mean, more than one year, I always try to get an MRI to confirm whether there is an underlying osteomyelitis or biomyositis also yeah so indication should be one if the pain or the tenderness is extending beyond the joint and there are tenderness along the thigh swelling is along the thigh because you want to see whether there is associated osteomyelitis because in that case you might also need to decompress the bone second indication is when there is uh, disproportionate swelling of the thigh so you want to see whether there is any soft tissue pocket and adolescents, especially adolescents have high likelihood of having uh, pyomyositis. So you might see some deep infection in the pelvic muscles, the obturator internus. Those are the cases. And this case, whenever you see this huge swelling, also uh, ask your radiologist to look at the uh, veins to see the thrombosis and take an ultrasound, do an ultrasound to make sure there is no associated DVT or superficial venous thrombosis. But for isolated septic hip, no swelling, typical 
as you said, ultrasound is enough and you may go ahead with clinical symptomatology. Yes, Meet, go ahead now. Yes, sir. So I, I would just like to mention that we had uh, earlier performed the radiographs for this patient and the uh, x-rays were normal. Yeah. So proceeding with the uh, proceeding with our second patient, the, the we performed an MRI of the left humerus and uh, there was a proximal humerus osteomyelitis with, uh, as we can see, there's a minimal subperiosteal collection. Now the history uh, was, it was very interesting. Like patient did not have much of the respiratory symptoms then, but the, when the radiologist did an MRI, he found on the adjacent lung side, there was patchy infiltration. And the radiologist called me up that, uh, sir, is bache ko COVID hai kya? I said, I, I, I patient came for shoulder pain. So they did the CT scan of the, the chest, thinking that this must be COVID. And uh, one of the young radiologists called me, sir, this COVID count is 18 out of 25. So that was severe pulmonary involvement with minimal respiratory symptoms at that point. And then we realized what is going on. Yeah. So Meet, go ahead. So this patient so, had... Uh, First of all, um, server, how would you read this MRI image? So, <clears throat> proximal humerus is uh, the prominent uh, feature here with uh, some intramedullary changes and I don't see the periosteitis that much elevated, maybe uh, due to less amount of collection uh, under the periosteum. So this would be osteomyelitis. Yeah, and, and we found in further images that this is going right down to the distal uh, diaphysis. So it was a kind of pan osseous disease with more focus on the proximal uh, humerus. Yes, Meet, go ahead. So this patient uh, had uh, the extra uh, skeletal manifestations were much more as compared to this. And uh, as I mentioned, we... Uh, there was a as we uh, the CT scan of the thorax done, which uh, showed extensive bronchopneumonia with a collapse of the right lung, along with a left subclavian vein thrombosis. So as we can see in the X-ray, uh, there's the right lung seems to be far more hazy as compared to the left, and uh, there's also uh, in the CT scan as well as we can see the similar finding. Along with that, in the color Doppler, we can see that there is a thrombus in the left subclavian. Right. So, uh, Sandeep is here. Sandeep, are you with us? Sandeep, are you here? Yes, Molin. Hi. Good morning. So, yeah. So, uh, you know, being at Wadia, you know, we have seen quite a few of these. And, mm -hmm. uh, right. So, when uh, the first point that you said, you know, that the swelling is out of proportion to what you see uh, in case of uh, typical osteomyelitis. So that is, you know, suggestive that there is something more going on than the osteomyelitis, and that can be a deep vein thrombosis. And, uh, you know, in such cases, it's always good to get, you know, apart from your routine sonography, either an MRI or a Doppler, you know, ask the radiologist specifically to ask, ask to do a Doppler. Uh, most commonly, it is MRSA because MRSA have what uh, we call the PVL gene or the pantene valentine leukocidin gene, which is thrombogenic. And in these cases, they are at high risk for DVT. So one thing about these is if you are working in a small nursing home setup, it is always advisable to treat this in an institute where you have the backup of entire you know, pediatric intensivist hematologist. Uh, I recollect one case, in fact, uh, where they had to put an IVC filter. In the mm -hmm. child was uh, getting pulmonary embolism. They put an IVC filter. And there were two children uh, throughout my career whom we have lost, uh, mm -hmm. who started off as MRSA with DVT and then, you know, developed pulmonary embolism and we lost. So, right. so very now important the question, to identify. Sandeep, uh, that's a... Uh fine conglomeration of severity of the disease. I agree with you completely. These are not a private setup cases. You should have good association with the intensive care people and uh, hematologist, ID specialist. So now for us, uh, patient was of course admitted to an uh, ICU. He was not maintaining his oxygen saturation. 
His uh, blood work, uh, meat would show in a moment where uh, very CRP is were in two hundreds. But how would you proceed now if the child is not maintaining it, uh, the saturation? Would you uh, give focus first on the respiratory clearance, or you would go with um, uh, orthopedic management, or uh, the blood management? The, the total counts were declining. The D dimers are high. How would you proceed? Well, it's a vicious circle. I mean, the yeah. primary focus is the bone over here. Unless you clear that infection, you know, the lungs are also not going to clear. So, with the high risk, with the you know, you are uh, pediatric anesthetist, uh, you know, fully prepared for all eventualities. There is no option here to go at it. Exactly. So um, that's right. You can see this D dimer is four thousand and fifty. So, so the patient is already going into DIC, and uh, CRP is two hundred and sixty-four. Typically, uh, when the counts are not that high in uh, proportionate to CRP, we should suspect the MRSA because, as you said, PVL, that is uh, PVL secreting uh, toxin, destroys the white blood cell membrane. So WBC count will not raise; it will decline, and uh, CRP is high. So, Taral, uh, Taral, what do you have to say for this? So, so uh, Maulin, see, there are three types of setups available for treating this. One is your own orthopedically inclined nursing home where you do most of your work. Second are ICUs, which are, you know, NICUs and small ICUs, which do take care of critical patients, but they are not equipped with OT. But this is a case which needs to be treated by an institution, as Sandeep rightly suggested. So if you ask me what will you do first is first shift to an institution yeah and not treat in an orthopedic setup or an icu setup but it requires more than that. right so that's right and patient was shifted there and uh, we have very uh, dynamic team of intensivists with icu on wheel and, and so uh, so we, this was a dilemma and uh, patient was treated with high antibiotics we usually give vancomycin and uh, clindamycin. Clindamycin is uh, considered to be neutralizing the PVL toxin. We don't uh, have, unfortunately, Khanjan with us. He, he was to be here on the panel. Uh, and at, after two days, you know, we, we had our pediatric surgeon colleague. And us, so we did this uh, uh, thoracotomy and ICD insertion and the orthopedic lavage together. So, me, please take us through the journey uh, of both the cases. So, in a in the six year old patient uh, with the complaints of the hip, the total count was not raised. The, it was around four thousand six hundred. The CRP was one zero nine. Platelets platelets were significantly reduced at sixty thousand, and D dimer was extremely high at eight thousand two hundred. And uh, in our patient with the proximal luminous complaints, the total count was eleven thousand. ESR was hundred. CRP two sixty four. D dimer was four thousand, as we have already discussed. SGOT and SGPT there was mild elevation as well. And uh, as is our protocol, uh, uh, the blood cultures were sent for both of these patients. So uh, for the next for the next step, what we performed was in the in our patient with the complaints of the hip, there was the surgery was delayed due to as we have discussed the low platelet count of sixty thousand. So we uh, transfused platelets and FFP. And subsequently, we performed the hip arthrotomy along with a subperiosteal uh, drainage and a metaphyseal window was made and uh, intramedullary giggly saw wire decompression was performed. So the delay should not like uh, FFPs and platelets should be infused in a couple of hours and then patient should be taken for surgery. But here, this patient also developed a reaction to infusion. So that, that was the reason of a 24-hour delay before the intensivist stabilized the patient. But otherwise, uh, you should infuse and you take the patient fast for the surgery. That's the call. Yeah, me. So proceeding with, our, with the second patient, uh, we, as as I mentioned, we uh, uh, took a medicine, uh, chest medicine opinion, and uh, a pediatric surgeon was uh, came along with us, and a right side thoracotomy and ICD insertion was performed. And uh, we performed a uh, left shoulder arthrotomy, subperiosteal drainage, and intramedullary giggly saw wire decompression in the same sitting. 
so these are the post op x rays of our uh, of the patient uh so the uh, this is the first patient the 6 year old boy 2 weeks after the surgery he developed uh, severe breathlessness now for this uh, the hrct thorax was uh, done and which showed that the, there was a right side mild to moderate pleural effusion and multiple septic emboli so for the same he had uh, he had to undergo an icd insertion as we can see in the x ray so um jayant is with us jayant are you there uh, sorry molin was he on heparin as well uh, yeah so that that part has been missed that the, both these patients were on low molecular weight heparin yeah right. and we were constantly <laughs> checking their uh, inr and pt aptt so that that was there now we saw all the data of uh, this mrsa and there is a concomitant uh, you know affect uh, this in 2 3 days they would develop lung in infection if it has to be but not after the drainage of the primary site but this child who had a, a fever on and off uh, who had um, uh, you know the uh, crp was not getting down as quickly and then he had subtle chest symptoms but on as you see this both the children required hospitalization for more than 2 weeks and on the second week his uh, chest problems were significant to warrant this uh, ct and placement of uh, Uh, icd so both this patient required chest intervention also so this that was bit new that uh, we thought that the now we we did not have this uh, uh, position to put this uh, inferior vena cava filters and all but as you said you know the, that that is done in some centers and that that would prevent subsequent chest infection or meningitis or uh, pericardial infection uh would it have been in the, done in this case we might have prevented this but that that happened little later on uh, yeah, well, so, yes jayan so the septic emboli is i think different from the ivc filter ivc filter is to prevent a large thrombus uh going and blocking the pulmonary artery so um the septic emboli i don't think you can prevent it really i mean it's it's a um, Um, the micro emboli you mean yeah 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 and you know even we have a very good pediatric surgical team with us <clears throat> i work in a large tertiary hospital with very good intensivists right so we we largely leave this problem to the intensivists to manage and just go and see the patient once a day and make sure from an orthopedic standpoint patient is stable uh, such patients have a very high mortality rate so it's really not something that um i have ever felt competent to manage or handle um and i think uh, having a multidisciplinary team is extremely important um right. for 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 various reasons and these uh, children you know they you know we 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 have had considerable mortality in this in this in this particular group and it's very touch and go and yeah, i think so the, uh... management, other than the initial decompression there's nothing we can do really exactly. to make any meaningful difference yeah, so, so the point of presenting this case is you know at times the patient comes to you first and then you refer to this uh, intensive care team and at times you have to yeah kind of coordinate everything uh, different people but by and large Absolutely. our role our role is to do the drainage and rest of them should be managed by this involving different uh, specialists yes taral yeah. from from orthopedic view point you know two points that we have to look for one thing is multi focality is very common so even right. if you drain one side you have to always keep a watch whether he is developing infection anywhere else secondly even the local uh, local complications like you know a uh, need for re exploration and drainage pathological fracture these are the higher yeah. incidence in you know exactly. this category of patients so that they need uh, i agree with you that they need multiple time interventions fortunately <laughs> this child did not require uh, this children did not require second surgery but i agree with you yes taral yeah so i i agree with sandeep uh, fully that you know all, all these patients have higher rate of complications i think molinu managed it very well did not have repeated surgeries but the the learning points from this cases is, is that 
osteomyelitis and septic arthritis they are now presenting in variety of ways it's not the standard textbook picture for That's the right. young pediatric orthopedic surgeons fellows who are attending this you know i would suggest that every child with osteomyelitis or a septic arthritis you treat whether it's in a major city or a small city please take x ray chest please do blood you know spo2 on these patients learn to auscultate the chest if possible if not at least have a pediatrician to see the patient when you admit because these yes, patients ma'am. can and and when we say blood test we always send for cbc asr and crb please add serum creatinine in the cnr and and sgotpt to all these patients as a protocol the key key thing besides this you know we have to be good, good clinician you know many a times chest x ray may not show the picture because we are not capable of reading x rays also but talking to family talking to child and learning about the new complaint should guide you about the uh, the presence of multiple problems most of us they uh, i mean we we should not be just the x ray or mri doctor we must be a good clinician to uh, to take out all the complaints this child has you know to identify them yes uh, me sorry to sorry to be interrupting you just you too, know uh, too much to expect from an orthopedic surgeon to be, be a clinician that's why you know all the team and let them do that job yes yes that's right yes Molly, uh, uh, yeah. just uh, keeping aside this case a routine a case which looks like a routine osteomyelitis do you choose and you know give the antibiotics that's your own decision or do you involve a pediatrician see for uh, routine uh, cases we have in- infectious disease specialists in our town and we had a word we involve we involve them but we start with vancomycin and ceftriaxone for all the cases considering it as a severe case severe mrsa infection we send blood culture and tissue uh, the fluid culture in all the patients and in 48 hours we take find the report if that is mssa then we de escalate our antibiotic regimen but we the strategy is hit hard and hit early and then de escalate or if it mrsa and very high crp then we add clindamycin also so first we start with venco and ceftriaxone ceftriaxone takes care of gram negative also so that is our regimen and after two days we uh, we change according to the culture report what is your uh, last question from my end does it change for new nets and also the duration of antibiotics for new nets because most pediatricians they say that oral antibiotics have no value in your nets so you have to continue you know iv antibiotics for 3 weeks that is what you know the pediatrician say i i think um, let, let us not discuss neonatal uh, thing it's a wide i subject. know but i thought i would just and I, i agree that neonates are absolutely different uh, and their antibiotic depends on where the infection has come from is it for an nic infection or a community or patients uh, uh, is a, a possibility of fungal or but uh, you are right that that they need iv till 3 to 4 weeks uh, compared to older kids let's okay. quickly meet go yeah. through the case and we have couple of more cases to discuss yes so fortunately this child recovered quite well and uh, after the acid insertion it was uh, once he was settled it was removed and uh, this was our follow up from yesterday in fact and uh, as we can see the child has full range of uh, hip uh, move- movements and here is the walking video is quite comfortably walking and he has no complaints at present yeah move ahead so this was the patient with <clears throat> who had a the proximal humerus affection and uh, as we can see this is what he had faced so he was kept on o2 supports required regular chest physiotherapy and uh, up, this was the other image with the sling is post surgery and this is his most recent follow up that we have and uh, he has full range of motion of uh, left shoulder but before reaching this stage you know they they uh undergo a lot of ups and downs there are a lot of prayers from parents and doctors so these are really challenging cases and the jayant rightly mentioned uh there are high chances of uh, mortality 
but fortunately these two cases come in one week and uh, both of them uh, went ahead on healing well without any residual problem yeah meet let's go to the second case any any comment jayant uh, let's keep so the, the literature is, yeah. for yeah. for the really severe osteomyelitis um, which is usually mrsa and sometimes mm. pvl we have mm. found uh, using stimulan even in acute osteomyelitis uh, to be useful to, to get local control so yeah. when the crp is 200s 300s child is very sick i think early uh, debridement and not just making drill holes in the bone but actually taking a cortical window out and completely mm. de decompressing the medullary canal and putting uh, stimulant pellets uh, loaded with vanco and genta we have found mm. that to be useful to to just reduce the whole inflammatory response and push that child from a you know high inflammatory state into a sort of healing state it just flips the child from whereas if we do, if we had I, i don't know i don't have enough cases to kind of conclusively prove this but yeah, our so anecdotal experience is that it yeah. helps so that that's right fine any uh, by the time neet um, gets the second presentation uh, any final comments uh, server or uh, very interesting cases to uh, see actually mm -hmm. I, i haven't faced uh, this uh, type of cases with uh, osteomyelitis and concomitantly other chest problems did you uh, did you ask for the ct chest uh, or the uh, the other things at the first instance or no actually actually the, the ct chest when the chest problems are there we should refer them to the intensivist the ct chest we got before surgery incidentally because uh, on humerus osteomyelitis there was a picture of lung and that was showing uh, infiltration so the ct chest was done it's not uh, on our prescription but the intensivist or pediatricians they they prescribe but it's not a routine but uh, as taral said that we should be looking for uh, chest their saturations some of them they they uh, their fever is not going and they can also develop pericardia pericarditis and we also have seen some meningitis in some patients so this septic uh, focus can go to different places and uh, we need to have a good uh, intensive scheme yes let's let's let's, uh, let's see this uh, covid you know covid uh, uh, era case yes meet please take us through so uh, this is this title challenges in management of post infective pharyngeal loss so we have a 9 year old girl uh, who suffered from an undisplaced fracture of the first metacarpal she was conserv conservatively managed with a plaster and uh, however on the 10th day of the plaster she uh, her parents uh, noticed foul smell from the plaster and so they had it removed and uh, what they saw was there was a raw area along with uh, discharging pus and uh, so they went uh, ahead and they, they were uh, prescribed uh, iv antibiotics which was started and she presented was at the age of 9 years so me just stop here now uh, taral is here jayant is here now i i have been hearing this uh, for many times you know and it is frightened now this family developed so much of apathy with the plasters because they thought that the infection happened because of plaster so uh taral when we apply plaster for simple fracture or a buccal fracture uh what do you advise to family that uh, when they should approach us if they have systemic viral infection would you consider antibiotics to prevent this secondary infection what is your advice you know taral or jayan so so this was never a fracture this was osteomyelitis from day one if you ask me but there there was a fracture kind of undisplaced fracture was there uh, yeah um i i would still favor um the fact that many suppose a trauma because i have removed many plasters from um frank uh, you know metaphyseal osteomyelitis cases like okay. uh, probably a dozen cases i would have removed where they went with minor trauma 
and X-ray was done, and the immediately plaster was applied outside, and then a few days later they come to us, you know, with unrelenting so, uh, pain. So I agree with you completely because sometimes you know people there is a trauma. I mean, there is a complaint of pain, and always parents would correlate the child fell yesterday from bed. That might be the reason of this, but they might have an early infection, and sometimes to just to uh, you know. Uh, to immobilize, they apply plaster and they don't take care to bring the patient in. Exactly. And the family thinks that this is the fracture, so it will pain. And they, they come after some days when there is foul discharge. So I agree, Jan, uh, with this. So that might be an infection to start with without obvious radiologic thing. But because but you... fractures, see, undisplaced fractures getting infected without, you know, it's I, I, have, I have never seen that. I, the, the other scenario where infection is mistaken to be a plaster is is the is the only scenario I have seen. I have not can, seen can an it, undisplaced uh, fracture getting can, infected. Can it happen that if a if a child has systemic infection hmm. like URTI or ear infection in a setting of a, an undisplaced fracture, can it become secondarily infected? I have I have never encountered. I mean, it can happen obviously, but I have never encountered that scenario. Okay. So looking at of this, you know, the patients coming to us, this patient's coming to us, you know, someone had applied plaster, it is fracture. And I, I also don't recollect that I see previous x-ray of all the patients, but you are right. So I was so frightened that now I've started telling family that if any spike of fever comes, you approach us back. Because we don't want it to get second. But in our patient, which are coming to, we apply plaster only if there is radiologic uh, fracture. And Tushar had some comment. Um, if pain increase, it can be infection. Yes. So, so for all the young fellows, you know, whenever you applied plaster for buccal fracture or us even keep the patient in loop, ask family that this the course should be downhill. Patient should not have pain. But if child develops pain or fever, you immediately come back to us because we want to rule out associated or underlying infection, secondary infection. Yeah, Meet, go ahead. So the initial presentation was first discharging sinus along the crease of the thumb. There was abnormal first uh, metacarpal, metacarpophalangeal mobility and there was a raw area of the dorsum of the hand. Uh, we, performed an M uh, there was an we performed an MRI and there was marrow edema of the first metacarpal and proximal phalanx. So for this, uh, we, uh, as, uh, we performed a debridement of the raw area along with a medullary canal decompression and uh, so slab immobilization was done. Two weeks later, uh, there was no pus discharge. The, there was, however, there was persistent first uh, MCP joint instability and the dorsum raw area showed a good granulation tissue. So this is what we performed. We transfixed uh, the in unstable first MCP joint with a K wire and the, the dorsum raw area was covered with a uh, split thickness skin graft. So now here, managing this child at every stage, whenever I say that we need to apply a plaster, the family was frightened. The sir, you apply a plaster, it will start discharging pus again. So we don't want plaster. So, so we, um, we placed a wire just to stabilize and our plastic surgeon said that this patient seems non-reliable. If I put a graft and if they remove the plaster at home, you, you fix it. And apply a slab. Uh, this, uh, uh, Tushar, it developed MRSA later on. It, it developed MRSA, but was not. It was a localized infection. Was not like PVL secreting. And this wire looks uh, a bit out from the proximal fragment in the uh, one of the views, but it had a good stability. I can assure that. Yeah, Meet, go ahead. So the patient was now lost to follow up, and. Uh, Two months later, they presented to us with this, and uh, as so we can again, uh, they their their patient had some pain or some, uh, and so they were frightened, and they removed the plaster at home, and they got wired removed at the native place, and then now they comes back to me at two months, and uh, with we got an X-ray, the thumb looked little shorter. And I saw this uh, sequestrum <coughs> and these, uh, the phalanx was uh, resolving. 
so server how would you uh, deal with this now now this is uh, this child has presented with this fortunately the overlying skin looks okay the skin graft has taken off well patient is again frightened of uh, plaster and this x ray how would you the, the blood markers are no, within normal range okay thank you molin so the proximal phalanx is almost gone only a, a little amount remaining and the first metacarpal is also eroded isn't it so i don't know but uh, maybe a spacer vascular technique uh, could be a uh, hmm. way of managing this case mm -hmm. uh, right so my uh, you how would you immobilize or distract it I prefer to immobilize with plaster, but your patient and the patient's parents are not uh, helping. But the I plaster, think. plaster will not prevent collapse. You know, I mean, uh, immobilize in this position. Okay. Uh, in this situation. Right. So, Taral, uh, Sandeep, Gaurav, any idea? Would you do differently? Uh, as server said, I think you know, basically is a good idea. However, what is vital is we have to understand whether the proximal and distal articular surfaces are intact. Mm. Because, you know, what are you going to interpose that into if, when, you know, that is destroyed? There is nothing... Uh, I think the articular surface of uh, this metacarpal is also gone, probably. Mm. You know, and the middle phalanx is almost lost. I mean, the proximal phalanx is almost lost. It's sequestrated. So, how would you manage that it? Case, mm. The infection has definitely settled. It looks like settled, yeah. The blood markers, there is no redness, inflammation. We, we never know. It might, uh, you know, uh, exacerbate once we operate upon them. So, at least we don't want to do any primary intervention at this point. So, if the articular I mean, surface were gone, then, you know, I have no clue. You tell us what you did. Sorry? If the articular surfaces are gone... Hmm. And I really don't know, you know, how to go about it. You tell us what you did. I mean, yeah. Taral, uh, Taral said imaging. Uh, Taral, you said imaging. Yeah, I think so. Imaging was imaging. I mean, I'm... so uh, just want to say, tell Molin that imaging of pediatric hand is very hmm. specific and uh, it's difficult because there are special hand coils available. But if you send to an ordinary MRI, they will not be able to do a good job. It will be a very grainy image from which you will not get any information. You send, need to send to a three Tesla machine, which has a hand coil, where a super picture of this joint can be obtained. And you should go for cartilage sequencing. The information you will get from this MRI is whether there is any, what is the amount of residual cartilage which is still present, and if there is any residual infection present on it. So I would do MRI at this stage. To, so, to, uh, to decide I, I agree, uh, Taral, with that. But to me, like MRI, uh, we have the child already have one MRI before GA. This young girl required multiple anesthesia, and I would get X-ray of the opposite extremity to see how the uh, articular surface of this metacarpal looks like. To me, it looks like that that uh, articular cartilage is eroded. Maybe distal phalanx is well, looking well, and the middle phalanx. My question is to how would you treat it? Say there is mild uh, infection, mild collection. You have to take this sequestrum out. How would you immobilize it? Sandeep, Taral, Sarvar, Gaurav, what, what would you, uh, how would you immobilize it? Or you would just uh, debride and apply plaster and come for the definitive management later? Sir, I will use an X fix and can we some... use uh, some sort of external fixator like mini X fix? All right. So like jazz fix it as uh, Tushar is saying. So that 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 was our idea also that we'll put an uh, mini fixator, take the sequestrum would... out and debride uh, after opening whatever it is. And once the bed becomes dry, we will come back and do the definitive uh, procedure, or just to put a small cement block in between and uh, as uh, the Sandeep said a mus muscular technique 
and then we apply a plaster. That's what I said. We need to, even though we apply a fixator, we need to support it with a plaster because the fixator cannot give rotational stability. And again, the family uh, escaped. The patient flied away again then after hearing the name of plaster. So, Gaurav, uh, I mean, uh, meet show what happened further. So, uh, we advised them for sequestrectomy along with uh, an ex external fixator. Uh, however, the patient was uh, lost to follow up thanks to COVID-19 and they were lost for two years. Two years later, they came with this clinical image. As we can see, the right thumb is grossly shortened and uh, it's uh, you can see the function in this video. So it looks like a rudimentary thumb as we see in radial club hand, you know, the, the uh, metacarpal, carpometacarpal movement is there, but there is no movement at uh, metacarpophalangeal joint or interphalangeal joint. And due to this, she is not able to uh, do grip, grasp, holding objects. It's uh, like a hypoplastic thumb, I agree. Uh, so now, uh, can you show the x-ray meat? Yes, sir. So this was the image at present and uh, the sequestrum seems to have been dissolved at this point. Yeah. So now, uh, Sandeep, how would you manage this at this point? Now there is no, for two years, there is no infection. Uh, the, there is a small bit of uh, sequestered bone piece, but most of them are self-resolved. Uh, so let's quickly go through, Amit, what we have done. Yes. So we exposed the gap, gap non-union site and uh, we used a fibula strut graft and fixed it with a K-wire. So at two months, uh, this, this is the X-ray that we have. And on subsequent follow-ups, we can see that the graft is, uh, the fibula graft is taking up well. At five months, it had almost uh, regained uh, in, uh, the, image of the surrounding bone. So that is when we decided to remove the K wire. And this was what we have at one year post reconstruction. So starting from this, uh, with a rudimentary thumb, she has now uh, reached a nearly normal looking uh, hand, her dominant right hand. This was her functional outcome. And uh, as you can see, the, there's the cosmetically, there's no difference between the two hands and uh, she can also grip. She has started to grip objects and this is the uh, video that we have now. So the opposition is coming from the... From the fingers and not the thumb. From the metacarpo, carpo metacarpal joint. Yeah. Uh, the Harsh is asking, how is the FPL function? FPL was uh, okay, Harsh, but we as we have to do IP and MCP fusion, uh, uh, there was no, uh, I mean, FPL, whether it is functioning or it was no uh, purpose, you know, we have fused those joints. What we could give is uh, the, the stable thumb so that she can grip the bigger objects, she can hold the uh, the uh, bigger objects. Now, Meet has not placed this photograph of how she is holding glass and mobile, uh, but she can do that. And uh, the, the learning point is, what is most important is when this patient came for surgery, I said, see, the plaster is must. Whatever we do, we put a, a wire across, fibula, fixator, but this is such a small hand, we would have to apply plaster for a pretty long time till the fibula gets incorporated. So before uh, doing surgery, you know, uh, I counseled the family twice that it, it will not work if you go home and remove the plaster. So that is the, that was the key. And whenever we treat phalangeal loss, it takes four to five months for the grafted fibula to get incorporated where there is no periosteum left. So, so it will be, uh, it will be a very challenging thing. 
uh, server is asking what is IP and MP angulation at what angle did you fix? Um, well, uh, we had to put it, we kept it in an opposition abduction extension position and we transfixed it. And once we removed the wire, there was a bit of, uh, uh, you know, uh, carpal metacarpal movement, but there is, as we, as we see, there is no interphalangeal or MCP uh, movement. So it, it has just given a stable stump, but cosmetically, uh, this is very rewarding for the family, for a girl child. Uh, I hope she'll do better with more uh, compensations at other places. So thank you, uh, Meet, for taking us through that case. Thank you. So one now I to everyone, uh, one question to everyone about the close fractures. Thoral is there, uh, Zora, uh, Sandeep, Sushad. The in children in close fracture, do you routinely go for antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics for a few days? They were. Sandeep? No, never. Never. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Any any other questions by the time I, I bring out my uh, presentation? Mm -hmm. Why I'm not able to share? Let me see. How I you decided, you know, I uh, I put a, a stitch over the uh, finger and I pulled it. And the maximum uh, length, you know, we got, we placed that much of graph. That's how we measured. So we, with a stitch, we kept uh, distracted. And then we measured that this much graph will be uh, taken. And that's how we chose the length. Now, Meet, you have to come to my room because I'm not able to uh, share this. Let me see. Just a moment. Uh, I'd open this window, but let's see. Uh, Molin. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah Tarun. Say something. The length of stump is very important. That's, that's and it's right. not how much you can pull. It is how much length of stump is required for opposition. And a that's simple right. way to do this will be to measure length from the opposite thumb. But, you know, most of us have different lengths of thumbs. You know, even I have different lengths of thumbs for my left and right. So, right. it would be what is good enough to get a good grip, a position grip. And yeah, the, the only, only... for that purpose, you may have to use an intro distractor. Yeah. Uh, and then, but, but if you lose, if you err on the length, then your function will not be the best. The, the only thing is, you know, uh, we kept this tourniquet off and see how much distraction we can do because sometimes by putting an overzealous length of graft, uh, you may have vascular, uh, you know, uh, vessels may get uh, closed. So that was what, and of course, we, we looked at the other side. So, right, let, let's take, uh, let me take you through this a novel concept. You all know abduction contracture is a common occurrence in brachial plexus palsy. So I'll talk about what is it? Is it a misnomer? What causes it? How to assess or evaluate it? What are the limitations caused by abduction contracture? What are the current options we have for the management? And what new method I'm suggesting you here today? So uh, what is putty sign or abduction contracture? It's an obligatory tilt of scapula on brachiothoracic abduction. Uh, and it is known as putty sign. So this child who is not able to keep the arm adducted, the moment you adduct it, the, the supramedial angle of scapula will become prominent. And in many children, it is very cosmetic disabling. And if uh, cosmesis is not concerned, the, the that shoulder remains drooped. And the young girls, they always complain that their sleeves or uh, their, their clothes, it, it falls down. So that's a real challenging problem. Uh, and surgically, you always see that uh, when you adapt the arm, the medial and superior angle of scapula will become prominent, you know. So in abduction, the scapula is not prominent, but the moment you adapt, the medial angle of scapula moves. And I always, always, I say it's a misnomer. It's not just the abduction, but also the external rotation, passive external rotation, which brings the scapula more. So it's not only abduction contracture, but the entero-inferior capsule is also responsible. 
So this is intraoperative uh, picture. When we reduce the glenohumeral joint, the scapula become prominent. The moment we uh, uh, we keep the arm adducted in turn rotation and the humeral head is dislocated, the scapula sits down. And the moment you reduce it, the dislocated humeral head, supero postero superior dislocated humeral head reduces to the entero superior, entero inferior joint, stretching the entero inferior capsule. So this is not just the abductor uh, tightness or abductor atrophy, but probably also the capsule is also responsible. Uh, capsular contracture is also re uh, responsible. So uh, what causes it? So there are a lot of research being done worldwide. And uh, this is a paper from uh, Cincinnati, Kevin and Roger published it. And um, they said there is probably atrophy of abductors. They did MRI and they found atrophy in abductors or atrophy of adductors they found in some. And as I mentioned, I always ask that is it, uh, there is also capsular contracture which might be contributing to this. But uh, there is also a uh, newer concept that it is not only limited to the soft tissue, but there, might, there is also associated scapular deformity. So Rahul Nath uh, has published this, this, the scapular deformity, and he termed it as a sheer deformity of scapula. That is scapular hypoplasia, elevation, and rotation. So these children and, uh, have scapular deformities, and there is a classification of shear deformities. And uh, Rahul Nath has uh, suggested triangular tilt operation, wherein he does the clavicular and acromion osteotomy so that the rest of the scapula sits in an anatomic position with a lot of uh, complications associated with this. Now, how abduction contracture affects in our clinical practice, we have seen that family always complains that the one shoulder is dropped. And so the child walks very um, uh, uh, abnormally many a times. And parents always ask them to make, uh, make the shoulder straight. And when they, are, they make the shoulder straight, they elevate their uh, uh, the arm. So, and as I mentioned, the slippage of clothing is a problem. And sometimes cosmetically, it is highly un unpleasing, you know. So what uh, options we have? The different surgeons across the globe, they have suggested different ways. Supraspinatus slide or Botox has been suggested by Kevin Little and Cornwall from Cincinnati. I have done it for many times and I have failed to correct the abduction contracture. The reason is very obvious that there is uh, not only muscle, but also capsular contracture and bony deformities. So with just supraspinatus slide, we cannot correct it. And supraspinatus is very important abductors and stabilizer of shoulder. So by doing slide, we might be abnormally hampering shoulder function. So that is not a very good option for it. Resection of supromedial angle of scapula is done by Sevan from sick kids. So uh, this is okay for a uh, very mild, mild form of deformities where there is minimal pro prominence of the medial angle of scapula and you just resect it as we do it in cases of strangled shoulder but it will not uh, take care of drooping of shoulder or the glenohumeral deformity. Peter Waters has suggested to add a virus uh, in derotation osteotomy of humerus. But again, we are performing surgery away from the site of deformity. And secondly, now we have to stage these two things. You know, some patients, once we do shoulder uh, rebalancing, and we reduce the glenohumeral joint, then this putty sign becomes more prominent. So these patients would need a second surgery to correct the humerus. Uh, and at that time, we correct the, uh, by putting the arm in more virus, we try to correct at a different level. So, and once you put an implant, you will need to remove the implant. So humeral osteotomy will need multiple stages uh, bes besides the primary rebalancing surgery. And finally, triangular tilt uh, as described by Rahul Nath to correct the scapular deformity. Now here we are doing surgery of the uh, clavicle and acromion. This bo both the bones are sub uh, subcutaneous. So when you are correcting very big deformity, these bones will become prominent. And there are a lot of cases uh, where the non-union of clavicle has been reported. So they have suggested to fix them. There are reporting of a failure of fixation. So triangular tilt 
although conceptually it's a good operation, it is associated with a lot of complications. So what um, I have thought and what I'm proposing today is a scapular body osteotomy to correct the abduction contracture. Now the question is how I thought about, thought about it. So I was performing a glenoid antiversion osteotomy once and inadvertently my osteotomy became complete. And that point, the abduction contracture or the putty sign resolved spontaneously. Like before a minute, there was severe uh, prominence of postromedial angle and uh, in a minute, it, it became normal. So I was thinking that what happened and then I realized that the, the linear osteotomy, the this, this scapula got collapsed from the neck and it, it assumed its normal position uh, automatically. So I was always thinking that I must, uh, that is, we should do scapular osteotomy to correct this. But performing scapular osteotomy at neck uh, is, uh, is not easy. You, you have important neurovascular pedicles. And then I realized that in Dana Mears resection for spangle shoulder, we used to perform a scapular body osteotomy and resection. So I thought, why we cannot perform that surgery? So let me show you one case and then we will discuss it. So this 2.9 year old boy with uh, uh, Naraka's 2 uh, with the passive external rotation of only 10 degrees, having severe trumpeting and active abduction of 80 degrees with weak triceps, internal rotator and wrist, uh, wrist dorsiflexors. And he had uh, this putty sign. Uh, you can see when I adduct, uh, the medial angle become prominent. And if you externally rotate further, this will become more prominent. And the family was complaining that always he keeps the arm away from the chest. And, uh, and by for doing anything, reaching mouth, the scapula becomes uh, very prominent. Intraoperatively, uh, you can see uh, the front view, the back view, and the top view, which shows prominence of the uh, postro superior angle of scapula. So what was the first step, step of surgery? It is an inverted L extensive posterior exposure, which we use for uh, uh, glenoid osteotomy is an inverted L incision. Uh, you reflect the uh, fasciocutaneous flap. And once you raise the flap, you find out the areolar plane just below the posterior deltoid. And once you uh, uh, open up the, uh, this plane, you reflect the deltoid from the scapular spine so that you can see subdeltoid anatomy. And then SS is a scapular spine. Here, here is a scapular spine. This is infraspinatus. This is the arm and this is the spine. This is the head end. And the next step is to dissect the conjoint tendon through the axillary, uh, through the axillary part from the same incision. So this is conjoint tendon I have dissected and this is deltoid. This is arm, child is prone. And once you have dissected that uh, for later tendon transfer, you now go to the spine of scapula. And this is supraspinatus and this is infraspinatus. And you expose subperiosteally the supraspinatus. And your osteotomy will start from a little lateral to the medial angle of scapula, somewhere from here. And it will go down on the lateral border of scapula between the insertion of delta, uh, the triceps and infraspinatus, okay? So this is uh, uh, teres minor, sorry, teres minor and deltoid. So let me show you the figure. So osteotomy would start from here. Just here comes the, uh, the suprascapular bundle. So you remain away from the supraspinatus, suprascapular neurovascular pedicle. Start from here and you go below the glenoid. So below the glenoid is a triceps insertion and then comes infraspinal. So, so you go somewhere between them and you complete your osteotomy as uh, if you have done Mears resection. What you can do is you can use an image intensifier to template your osteotomy. <coughs> so this will look like this. So you will put your wire, which is going from supra medial to infra lateral. This is the end of inferior end of glenoid. So you have to come little distal to this. And then you complete the osteotomy. The moment you complete the osteotomy, you will see the medial part of scapula moves by itself. It corrects itself 
and in this case this got uh, opened up from the top so it moved medially inferiorly and in anteriorly so this scapula which is elevated and rotated it comes back to its position like this and uh, you see the clinical picture then i finished my tendon transfer and once i adducted it there is no prominence of scapula i have not cut the angle of scapula and these are the post operative view you look at the front view and there is no prominence of scapula there is a back view there is no prominence of medial border of scapula and this is the top view so let us compare the pre and post surgery so this was before surgery you can see this and after surgery it is flat this is before surgery the back view the supramedial angle as well as the medial border of scapula is prominent now it is not seen and this is the top view which is most remarkably uh, uh, showing the this scapula was here jetting out and here it is almost normalized so and these are the clinical comparison front view so we we also got an post operative ct pre and post ct for this child yes this is the uh, this is the way we immobilized him we kept at kept it is about 20 degree abduction so that uh, you can see an external rotation i have not done subscapularis slide so i kept the external rotation little more but <coughs> for extended palsy we kept only 30 to 40 degrees these are the pre operative ct scan and you can see the uh, scapulo humeral angle on this non affected side this angle if you draw from the lateral border of scapula and medial border of humerus it is 30 degrees but on the affected side it is 60 degrees so this shows that this is the amount of abduction contracture there are different other ways of measuring abduction contracture but there is a simplistic way and you see this is the post operative ct scan see the uh, amount of displacement of scapula the scapula has shifted medially a bit inferiorly and it has uh, what, what do you say it is pro uh, retracted the uh, protracted which was earlier uh, uh, retracted so there is an opening the amount of opening we see at the scapular level that is amount of correction you have achieved you know in the abduction contracture so this is the uh, uh, the front view top view you can see that the displacement or distance between scapular spine and this is the amount of uh, anterior displacement of scapula now the question is whether with this scapula will heal or not but this is surrounded by periosteum uh, or all, all where and there are all muscles and we have done mears resection of scapula and we have never found issue with the union or mal union of scapula the question is whether will this alter the mechanics of uh, movement of serratus anterior or rhomboids so that time would tell us but at this point you know the patient is still in plaster and his deformity has gone the move the way the child is walking his shoulders are looking stable and i am keen on looking what what is the outcome of radiological as well as clinical outcome of this child so i have presented in front of you guys before presenting at international forum and would like to know your uh, suggestion or uh, and i would like to discuss this procedure with all of you thank you for your patient listening taral or uh, sandeep any any so thought on maintain, this or join maintain this opening uh, how would you make sure that your correction remains maintained uh so taral it what happens you know once you do osteotomy the scapula takes its own position spontaneously you do not need to maintain it you know because with this deformity uh, the scapula which is rotated uh, and translated in front with a bit of retraction you know or protraction it comes to sit in its native position so all the muscles periscapular muscles are in tension and the you adduct the arm and you see that the scapula has moved so even you do not need to move the arm the scap the medial part of scapula takes its own place because it was probably in tension for long so the question is we should perform this earlier rather than later because in later the scapular deformity becomes more structural you know that's what i i i believe so uh, 
So I have not done anything to kind of distract that uh, scapular osteotomy. It distracted by itself. You mentioned the role of capsular uh, tightness over here. Yeah. So any role for release of the capsule as well? So Sandeep, I'll tell you what I have done, what I have thought first of all that uh, when the dislocations are superolateral, you know, uh, we can always feel dislocated humeral head behind. And you might have experienced that once you do passive external rotation, the humeral head sits, it goes entero inferior in a true glenoid, right? So uh, I always felt that if a humeral head has been dislocated for long, there is contracture of not only anterior, but also inferior capsule. And once we reduce the humeral head, as that capsule cannot be stretched enough or there is not much space, it will move the whole scapula. So in few cases, I have done inferior capsular release through the axillary approach, you know, after uh, retracting the axillary nerve, I have released the inferior capsule and a bit of entero inferior capsule. And once you reduce the humeral head, you can see the humeral head uh, from the from axilla. It's coming out. In a couple of young children, I saw that this uh, uh, putty sign relieved by this. But for older children, it did not relieve the putty sign completely. So I think that only capsular release is also not a solution because in older kids, there is al already a scapular deformity has set in. So we have to do something more than just capsular release. And this procedure, I guess, must be in conjunction with other procedures as well, you know, isolated. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. So yeah. you can do the tendon transfer uh, along with this because infraspinal. See, we we do this approach for glenoid antiversion osteotomy, where after doing osteotomy, we we do tendon transfer. Here, we I have yeah. performed osteotomy medial to the glenoid, and I have performed the tendon transfer. If you want to release this anterior capsule, you can do in from the front. But this case was a five, six, seven, and I could achieve passive external rotation uh, to 45. I can always do a minimally invasive subscap release from this incision. Uh, there's no problem. You know? Good. So we have a solution for this problem. No? I don't know. Like uh, I, I will present the, uh, what do you say, the result. You know, the, I shared this with uh, some shoulder surgeons in uh, abroad in Europe, and they say they had doubt that the serratus anterior works with the a normal uh, some position of scapula when we do these osteotomies its fulcrum changes and they have shown that this parascapular muscle may not work normally but i shared my results of uh, mears resection for sprangel shoulder and those all patients have very good degrees of active abduction and rotation they uh, we didn't see any problem if you have, have you done that um, dana mears resection uh, sandeep or taral no, no, no. So I, I was, you know, I was trained in uh, Toronto by Dr. Howard, uh, Andrew Howard. He used to do so. <coughs> me and Atul, when we came back, we did uh, about 10, 15 cases and then switched to modified greens. But again, in all those cases, uh, we had never problem of union or uh, movement. So I feel that uh, even this should not have problem. If it works, then it's a it's a real good solution, you know. Fine. So I think if uh, any any comment uh, server or anyone, uh, and then we'll wind up uh, this session. Any comment? We'll wait to see the results. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So so as me, I also want to see how it goes. Yeah, Gaurav, what do you think about this? Sir, yeah, so it looks very, I mean, the correction looks very significant, but uh, yeah, the only thing is how the child performs, what are the functions after the plaster is removed. I am quite hopeful that, uh, that the child will do good. And once we have a follow up, then we can. I mean, I am thinking of yeah. that if we can extrapolate it in other cases of winging of scapula, which we see. Yeah, that's right. So that there is one other set of patients with external rotation contracture. You know, after surgery, 
there also the posterior capsule is tight and along with that external rotators are tight we do arthroscopic posterior capsule release and at times we are not able to correct it completely but if we can correct it at the scapular level then uh, uh, we may not uh, compromise the strength of uh, rotators you know? so uh, there are different extended indications already in my mind but let us first uh, see how it goes from for this uh, this indication and then we'll proceed further so thank you very much uh, for your time everyone uh, especially sawar for your uh, time sandeep taral jayant you all were busy and you spared time for this meeting i'm i'm really thankful yeah thank you so I'm, I'm, i'm stopping the recording and then closing the session thank you very much take care bye bye